بسم الله الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله الحمد لله حمدا يوافي نعمه ويكافئ مزيده وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما يا كريم اللهم لا سهل إلا ما جعلته سهلا وأنت تجعل الحزن إذا شئت سهلا رب شرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي رب زدني علما رب زدني علما رب زدني علما Welcome back, dear viewers, to the Night of Power, the conference dedicated to you and bringing you quality uh, lectures from across the world with lecturers that are world-renowned in many parts of the world, uh, including Canada, the United States, and many other places, and alhamdulillah. It's a blessing to be part of this conference, and it, it should be a blessing for all of us, and we should recognize the fact that it is a blessing, and thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for having given us this tawfiq to be sitting here Whilst many other people may be watching other things, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving us the tawfiq to watch things that will get, get us closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whilst many other people may be spending their wealth and their time and so on and so forth in many other ways, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving us an opportunity to spend our time and wealth in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is definitely an overshorty, a blessing. And for the topic that I wanted to discuss uh, today, the topic is the topic of the tongue. The tongue. وَمَا أَدْرَاكَ مَا lisan. What do you know about this tongue? How would you know what this tongue is? You see, this is a tongue that can slice people's heart, hearts into pieces in a manner that a sword cannot. This is a tongue that can stitch up the wounds of people in a manner which a surgeon cannot. This is a tongue that can either hurt somebody or it can make somebody's life. This is a tongue that can either help somebody or it can totally uh, and, and entirely uh, do away with somebody and totally and entirely forsake somebody. This is a tongue that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed us with. If we use it in the right manner, then that is thanking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the blessing that He's given us. If we use it in the wrong manner, then that is us being ungrateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the blessing He has blessed us with. What I want to do today is not just talk about the tongue and all of the calamities of the tongue, even though that is something that is important to talk about. And that will be the bulk of our subject. But I also want to talk about the positive sides of the tongue. You see, the Prophet wasallam and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, in, in the Qur'an, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala of course has the most balanced of speech. The Prophet wasallam in extension to the Qur'an also had the most balanced of speech. So just as he had taught us of all of the calamities related to this tongue, and all the calamities related to any other limb of our body. They had also taught us of all of the positive sides of that particular thing or of that particular limb and object as well. So I'm going to start off with the positive side. All right. From the positive side, we see that the Prophet ﷺ had a beautiful tongue. A tongue that would utter nothing but goodness. A tongue that knew nothing but good. A tongue that considered the feeling of the person that it was addressing. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also teaches us this in the Qur'an as a commandment, as an imperative injunction from Him. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَقُولُوا لِلنَّاسِ husna." Say good things to people. Say good and sweet things to people. So saying good things is not a choice. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving it to us as a commandment. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us, say, which is an imperative verb. قُولُوا You people all together say what? Linnas for people all together as well, right? Not just for me, not just for you, not just for your buddies, not just for their buddies, and not just for your families, and not just for the people that you love and your friends, for the people that you hate, for the people that you love, for the Muslims, for the non-Muslims, for every single person. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, قُولُوا لِلنَّاسِ husna. So first of all, He generalizes in terms of the commandment. So He says, قُولُوا, you people all together. Qulu, there's a wa'u al-jama'ah, which means a plurality. So every single person that is going to read this Qur'an, Allah is commanding them, say you people all together. Linnasi, four people all together. Husna, a very, very beautiful, a very, very gauged, a very, very appropriate word. And do not use any word that is inappropriate. This is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us in the Qur'an. Qulu linnasi husna. So this should be a moment for us to think as we're hearing these verses and as we're understanding these verses and think and look at our book of deeds based on what we remember of them and how is it that we treat people. 
Because one, Allah is commanding us. Two, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is also sharing a virtue of saying good things as well. The Messenger sallallahu is sharing that virtue. And Allah shares it in the Quran as well. But let's go to the hadith. The Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says, Al-kalimatu tayyibatu sadaqah. Indeed, of a surety, this good speech that you speak, the good word that you see, that say that that is considered sadaqah, that is considered charity. If you have nothing to give this month, then you have a good word to give. If you have nothing to say that good, then at least close your tongue and don't say anything with it. Because the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi taught us that whoever believes in Allah in the final day, فَلْيَقُلْ خَيْرًا Then let him say something good. It's a, it's a test of belief to be able to only say good things. If a person is a true believer, then there is no way that anything evil can come out of this mouth of a believer. There is no way that something evil can come out of the mouth of a believer. What I mean to say by that is, that if a person has perfected iman, then that perfection will lead him not to say except good things. The more the person says bad things, naturally the iman is going lesser and lesser and lesser. Because the Messenger Wasallam attached the matter to iman. And the ulama, they say whenever Allah's Messenger Wasallam attaches such matters of action to iman, then that means that the kamalul iman, the completeness of iman lies within what? Within perfecting that particular matter. So when he's saying, those who believe in Allah in the final day, then let them say good or stay silent. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as Messenger sallallahu is teaching us that this is your perfection. This is where the perfection lies. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had commanded us further in the Quran to also not say bad things. You see, we have commandments to say good things from the, from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and from the Messenger alike. Then we have also encouragement by mentioning the virtue of saying good things. Then we have the example of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. How was the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha describes the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saying something that I think all of us, especially the husbands amongst us, we have to take an example from. And even the wives, because the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was an example for the wives and he was an example for the husbands alike. He was an example for the male, he was an example for the female. Except for those things that the female were specific in, Allah, Allah's Messenger وسلم, would give them specific dictations and guidelines regarding them. Things that were specific to them. So here's the Messenger وسلم, he comes home, he's tired, the Prophet وسلم, is discharging armies, the Prophet وسلم, is taking care of a lot of affairs, the Messenger وسلم, is outside in the morning giving fatwa, the Prophet وسلم, has Bedouin Arabs that have no akhlaq, no manners coming to the, him, grabbing him by his collars. The Prophet ﷺ has to deal with delegations that are coming from different countries. The Prophet ﷺ has to deal with, 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 with wahi and there's, there's a pressure related to wahi as well. The Prophet ﷺ has people asking him questions. There is the Yahud, the Jews within Medina constantly betraying the Prophet ﷺ. Here is an army from Mecca that is coming to attack the Messenger ﷺ. Here is... The, uh, here is people from other parts of the world, Sham, putting pressure on the Arabian Peninsula to stop the reign of the Messenger ﷺ. All of these tough matters, and the Prophet ﷺ is fully, fully what? Fully pressured, but he doesn't, what? He doesn't flip out. The Prophet ﷺ composes himself. The Prophet ﷺ does what? He understands how to, how to treat every single person in the way they should be treated. He enters his house, the Prophet ﷺ brushes his teeth, the Prophet ﷺ comes inside, the Prophet ﷺ kisses his wife, the Prophet ﷺ speaks in a beautiful manner, the Prophet ﷺ as Aisha says, if you were to describe how the Prophet ﷺ was in his house, it would be two words, طحوك and بسام. The Prophet ﷺ would be laughing, the Prophet ﷺ would be smiling. He would be joking around, he would be smiling, even despite the fact that he was being pressured so, so hardly. So much so that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, even more more than that, the Prophet is pressuring himself to worship Allah subhanahu wa taala, right? All of those pressures, internal, external, spiritual, emotional, political, and then the Prophet comes home and he's able to smile. This is the Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So we have a word from Allah, then we have an encouragement from the Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam, then we have. Also, the very char character of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam when he's dealing with people. This is your Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. This is how the messenger was. Now, at the same time, 
if the Prophet ﷺ had been really positive when it came to his way of speaking, and when he, it came to his encouragement of speaking good, Allah and His Messenger alike had also warned us of the calamities and the evils of the tongue. Because Al-Iman bayn al-Khawfi wa raja Belief is supposed to be between fear and hope. So they're giving us hope, encouragement, they're teaching us all of the positive things about what? About this idea of, uh, of, of speaking positively. But at the same time, they're also warning us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and I'll read out these verses and insha'Allah ta'ala, whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives to me from openings to understand these verses, I will try to share some of that with you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَيْلٌ لِكُلِّ هُمَزَةِ اللُّمَزَةِ Destruction, wail, destruction. The word of the surah starts off with destruction. How destructive is this matter for Allah to start off the surah right after He's already said, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. In the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the most gracious, the most merciful. Despite His grace, despite His mercy, Allah starts off with the surah, the surah with a word that's destructive, that if you hear it, it resounds in your mind. Wail, destruction. Be to who? Likudli humazatil lumaza. For every person that is a humaza. For every person that is a lumaza. What's a humaza and what's a lumaza? A humaza is a person who mocks another individual, but through his gestures. You know, sometimes we see a person walking and he's walking slightly crookedly. And then when we see them walking that way, we start mocking their walk by mimicking them, right? Or somebody has a speech impediment and he cannot speak properly and because of that what do we do? We start, we start making fun of them by copying them and sometimes even so insensitive that we may even do it in front of the individual. And sometimes people have a problem keeping their heads straight so we start one telling them that they're bobbleheads and things of such sort and maybe even doing that before them or behind them to what? To mimic them and mock them in that manner. So anyone that does these things, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَيْلٌ Destruction is to such a person. Humazah, the one who goes around mocking people through his gestures. Lumazah, and also the person who ends up mocking people through his speech. The one who starts saying evil things through his speech. The one who starts hurting people's feelings through his speech. Jarahatu asinani lahalti amu wa la yaltaimu ma jarah lisanu. A poet says that the wounds that are left behind because of a sword. The wounds that are left behind because of a sword, you will find that these wounds, wounds, they will be able to become healed over time. But if you take your sword that is your tongue, and you slice someone's heart open with your tongue by saying an evil word, time will never be able to get rid of that. If it's a tongue that you end up using, to go and slice someone's heart open, to say something that will hurt their feelings, then this is something that will go on forever, and it will not go on unnoticed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Even if you seek forgiveness from Allah, then you go and seek forgiveness for the person, you may be forgiven, but remember the feeling that you left him with, this will never go. And that's why psychologists say, people will forget everything. They'll forget the good things you do to them. They'll forget the bad things you do to them. They'll forget the nice things you do to them. They'll forget every single thing. People will forget the fact that you were neighbors at one point, or you used to go to school and play basketball together. And people will forget the fact that you used to go to school. And sometimes, you know, that happens. You know this guy for a long time, or this sister for a long time, and you've known each other, and then you see yourself with the person inside of a mall, in the same aisle, 15 years later, and nobody even wants to say salam to the other. People forget. But you know what people don't forget? This is based on what psychologists say, they will not forget how you make them feel. If you made a person feel good, whether it was because of a word or it was a kind gesture, you gave them something, you put a smile on their face, you alleviated them from a pain that they have, had, they needed to pay their doctor's bill and they weren't able to do it themselves, you did it for them and you were there to save the day for them. On that specific day, the feeling that they had towards you, that will not be forgotten. So when you leave behind people with feelings, trust me, they're not going to forget it. So you don't want to hurt people's feelings with your tongue. And on top of that, you have the other problem and that is that this is considered destructive. And we said, this is not from Iman. In fact, the Messenger ﷺ, he said in another hadith, 
In one hadith, we said, he told us that whoever believes in Allah and the final day, then let him say good or, or, or stay silent. So this is, the understanding of this is that if he doesn't fully believe in Allah and the final day, then what's going to happen is he's going to say bad things. But Allah's Messenger more explicitly said this as well. In a, another hadith in which the Prophet ﷺ said, لَيْسَ الْمُؤْمِنُ بِاللَّعَانِ وَلَا الطَّعَانِ وَلَا الْفَاحِشِ وَلَا الْبَذِي A believer is neither la'an, he's neither going around cursing people, nor is he a person that is poking people with his tongues, right? Ta'an. Literally, he's going and backbiting and poking people, people's egos and their emotions and their hearts and so on and so forth with his tongues. He's not such a person, he's a sweet-spoken person. Fahish, and neither is he an obscene person. This obscene, the, the, this thing, let's stop at it for a moment. Neither is a believer an obscene person, right? Neither is a believer so lowly that he goes down to speaking of shame, shameful things, right? Shamelessness begins to prevail in society through word. Why? It, it starts off with a thought, and then that thought becomes a word, and that thought, the word becomes an action, right? So the word is not something that a believer lets it get to. Sometimes a, a thought may come to a mind of a person. Nobody can protect their, and preserve their thought. We're still supposed to ward off evil thoughts, but a thought will still come, but it's not allowed to get to a word. The Prophet ﷺ said a believer cannot do that. He's not fahish. Just think about it for a moment in your own, in your own life, right? In your own life. When we're sitting around in gatherings, when the door is closed, it's really late at night, and it's a close group of friends, we start letting loose and talking about obscene things and shameful, and, and things that are considered shameless if we were to speak about them. We start doing that, and we don't find any shame therein, right? And there was the Messenger وسلم, had, had described, uh, the, the per, he had forbidden from this, and a woman came to the Prophet وسلم, forbidden from what? Describing what you do with your wife in uh, your private time with her, or your husband in your private time with her. So a woman came to the Prophet ﷺ and she said, By Allah, O Messenger of Allah, إِنَّهُمْ لَيَفْعَلُونَ وَإِنَّهُنَّ لَيَفْعَلُونَ Indeed, of a surety, they are doing it, as in men and women are also doing it. So the Prophet ﷺ, he said that the example of such a person is what? He said, the example of this person is like the example of a shaytan. لَقِيَ شَيْطَانَةً فِي قَارِعَةِ الطَّرِيقِ is the example of this person, is the, a, a Satan, a male Satan, who meets a female Satan in the middle of the way, and then what? And he does whatever he has to do with her, and then he walks away. Right? Why? Because these things that were supposed, these things are supposed to be kept behind closed doors. They're supposed to be kept behind curtains. And our conversations are also supposed to be gauged within these limitations where we're not getting too shameless when we're talking to one another. One, about our own personal lives, and sometimes even about other people as well. Right? Sometimes what happens in da'wah organizations as well, there's brothers and sisters working together, and then at the end of the, you know, at the end of the whole da'wah mission and everything's finished now, people get together like, what do you think about that sister? Huh? And I don't know what happens on the sister side, but I can tell you what happens on the brother side, right? What do you think about that sister, huh? She'll go really well with you. Akhi, that's not appropriate speech. That is truly not appropriate speech, right? If that sister knew that you were speaking of her as a joke, in this manner, what do you think she would have think, thought about you, right? And that's why the Messenger ﷺ had described ghiba to be what? He had described it to be mentioning your brother in a way that they will not like. You think that sister will think good of you after you make such a comment about her behind her back? Especially when you're just cracking a joke and you're not serious about the fact that maybe you're trying to get two people to come together in, 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 in a marriage contract and continue on and, and produce a family. That's a different story, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَيْلٌ لِكُلِّ هُمَزَةِ اللُّمَزَةِ الَّذِي جَمَعَ مَالًا وَعَدَّدًا Often people that are talking a lot of trash, and I'll call it that, right? What happens to them is, they're deluded by the dunya. Allah says, الَّذِي جَمَعَ مَالًا وَعَدَّدًا This person that is, that is humaza, this person that is mocking people with his gestures, this person that is mocking people with his tongue, often what is he? He's also doing another thing. He's hoarding wealth, collecting it, وَعَدَّدًا And he's continuously counting it, right? If you know Arabic, you'd know that to count, you say, عَدَّهُ يَعُدُّهُ Right? You don't say, عَدَّدَهُ 
Allah adds an, uh, adds an extra dal over here. Why? Because there's a bit of an emphasis, tashdeed, literally, right? There is an emphasis over here, and that is how often it occurs. There's people out there that every time they wake up in the morning, what do they do? Pick out the cell phone, and if it's going to be TD Canada Trust, or if it's going to be TM, or if it's going to be Maybank, or whatever, and go to the app and check how much the money is, right? So if a person is constantly attached to the dunya to this degree, then the people's feelings and consideration to people's emotions are not even going to ever come to his mind. Right? Because he's been deluded, he's lost in the dunya. So we have to ask ourselves, are we deluded with the wealth we have? If we don't open the app every morning, believe you me, the money is not going anywhere. The money is not going to go. You don't have to, before you even rub your eyes in the morning, open up your cell phone app to make sure that your money is still there in your bank account. Before it used to be wallets and now it's the apps, right? Inside of the phones. يَحْسَبُ أَنَّ مَا لَهُ أَخْلَدَهُ He thinks that his wealth will actually make him live forever. What does that mean? That means a couple of things. Number one, some people they give wealth for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or so it seems. And as they're giving wealth for the sake of Allah, or at least it seems that way, they have another intention behind their back, behind, behind the whole idea of giving that wealth. Right? And oftentimes this intention becomes apparent. It may not, but at times it becomes apparent. In what? I'll give this money, but I have to be what? I have to be honored for it. I need to get a big paycheck so I can stand in front of the world and show that the fact that I ended up donating so much money. I need to have my name imprinted on the wall of the center that I bought for you. I need to have my mas the masjid in my name and not in anybody else's name. If it's the library, it's going to be my library. My name. Everything is my name, 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 name. And Allah's Messenger ﷺ was told from the very get-go in his da'wah, it's not about your name. It's not anything about that. Allah's Messenger ﷺ was told, قُمْ فَأَنذِرْ Stand up and start warning people, وَرَبَّكَ فَكَبِّرْ And start glorifying your Lord. It's not about your name, it's not about my name, it's about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's name. When you're giving, give it for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? So people think that when they have wealth, they're gonna live forever. Right? And we have many examples in our times as well of people that were extremely famous and wealthy, and for their money they were extremely wealthy. And then, what happened? They died for a few months. They were on the best-selling shelves, right? The books, their autobiographies, so on and so forth, bestseller. And then after that, people don't even remember them anymore. People don't even know who these people are anymore. If you were trying to even recall their names, a decade goes by, people will not even remember their names. Number three, another way to look at this is that when people have money, especially in societies which do not offer free health care, people start to think that, that what? People start to think that We've got the money, and because of that, we're going to go to one type of medicine, then we're going to go to a second type of medicine, and then we're going to go to a third type of medicine. And if the, if the homeopathy didn't work, or if the regular conventional medicine didn't work, then I'll be able to go to a homeopath. If that didn't work, I'll go to a naturopath. If that didn't work, I'll go to an acupuncture therapist. If it wasn't that, aromatherapy. If it's not that, I'll go into a salt bath. If it's not that, I'll go for this, and that, and that. and. It, the list just keeps going, it doesn't finish. Why? Because I've got the money. And I can make myself live forever. But even if you go through all the therapies, and even if you go through every single type of ilaj, every single type of, uh, uh, of uh, you know, healing out there, even if you go through any type of medicine, you will not be able to get better if it's your time to go. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, He thinks His money is going to make Him live forever. كَلَّا لَيُنْبَذَنَّ فِي الْحُطَمَةِ Nay, he will be thrown into what? Al-Hutamah. He will be thrown into a fire that is known as Al-Hutamah. So let's stop for a moment. See, when a person is so self-conceited that he doesn't think about the feelings of other people, what happens? He's hurting their feelings. He doesn't consider them. He's also disdaining them as people, right? He's doing a lot of things, so he doesn't really care about humankind. He cares about himself because he's full of himself because of the money and power and fame he has, right? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, just as you're so self-conceited and you hurt people's emotions so badly, I will, I will totally neglect your existence by saying, Kalla, nay. Kind of like, who cares about you? But you know what? Let me explain to you what will happen to you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaking. La yumbadan. Indeed of a surety. So there is there is one emphasis with the lamb. This is called the lamb tawqeet. 
which actually has two different emphasis. One is a tawqeed and another one is a hidden oath that Allah has taken. So it basically means, Wallahi la yumbadhan. By Allah and of a surety. So there is a surety here. Yumbadhan, he will be chucked and not thrown. You see, when you care for something, not at all. You, you don't at all care for, for a phone or something like that. You know, there's this YouTube video, if you go online, somebody takes like a bunch of iPhones, puts them inside of a blender and starts blending them, right? And he destroys these iPhones like he doesn't even care about. Uh, he doesn't even care about them. And 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 there's like a song, in 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 the rap world. One of the lines from that is, and I'm not trying to do tafsir of the Quran with this, but I want to I wanted to get to you. It feels good to spend fifty grand and think nothing of it. What does this mean? This means I can do anything I want, and I'm above money. I think nothing of anything except myself. That's the reality. Right? It feels good to spend $50,000 and think nothing of it while there's thousands of people dying of hunger and you're thinking nothing of it. Are you kidding me? Really? Right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, when it gets to that point, I think nothing of you. And what will I do? I will chuck you. I will not place you. You will not be placed. You will not be thrown. You will literally be chucked. There's many ways to say something is thrown into something. The worst of those ways, and the most humiliating of those ways in the Arabic language is an-nabdh, when you literally take something and chuck it at somebody else. Allah says you will be chucked in, a hell, in the hellfire. And Allah emphasizes by the qasim, by the lamu tawqeed, Allah emphasizes by nunu tawqeed, the thaqila as well. So there is four or five ways of emphasizing in this particular word, word how much Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't care for this specific type of person, who doesn't care for people. And this fire will further make the person feel the misery because the fire is a special fire. It's called al hutama. What does what does hutama mean? Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says, "Wama adraka al hutama." I'll tell you what it means linguistically, but Allah is saying even if you understand the language, you still do not understand. Let me explain further. Allah says over here that the person will be chucked into the hutama. Hutama is a fire which literally shatters things into pieces. You see. Some things can burn things and melt them. Other things are so bad that when you throw something into them, they literally cease to exist because they, they become fumes. They become shattered. They don't even exist anymore. This is the type of fire it is. Hattama literally means to take a glass and shatter it. When you go inside of such a fire, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, it's not only going to burn you, it will shatter you into pieces. This is the fire that we're talking about. But that's the linguistic meaning. Allah says, even if you understand the language, it's still not enough. It's still not enough because this fire is further described by Allah. Allah says, وَمَا أَدْرَاكَ مَا الْحُطَمَةِ Whenever Allah says, وَمَا أَدْرَاكَ in the Qur'an, right? Whenever, throughout the Qur'an, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is doing two things. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is about to re re-establish the meaning of the word that is just about to come. Okay? There's many a times Allah says, وَمَا أَدْرَاك Whenever Allah says, وَمَا أَدْرَاك He's about to re-establish a meaning for it. You know the word hutama, but you don't really know it. I'm going to give you another meaning for it. So Allah is going to give you another meaning for it. And whenever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَا أَدْرَاك Another thing is, He will actually tell you. But when He says, وَمَا يُدْرِيك He will not tell you. So over here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَا أَدْرَاكَ مَا الْحُطَمَ نَارُ اللَّهِ الْمُوْقَدَ The fire of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala which has been kindled. It has been lived for a long time. This is a fire that is kindled. Number one, it is the fire of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whenever Allah attributes anything to Allah Himself, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is trying to magnify this, this specific thing, right? Whenever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala attributes anything to Himself, even if anybody else attributes something to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He's also trying to magnify, He's also trying to describe the superiority of this. An example of that is when Allah's Messenger وسلم, said about one of the kuffar Quraysh, the pagans of the Arabs, Quraysh, he said, Allahumma sallit alayhi kalban min kilabik. O oh Allah, take one of your dogs and, 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 and feed this human being to that dog. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not send just like a little pit bull or something. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent for that specific human being, Allah sent a lion for him. A lion ate him alive. He's from the same category of animals. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes a very, very gracious creature and sends it after this individual through the dua of Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So, Narullah, 
the fire of Allah. It's not a joke. It's not like the fire that we have in, in the world. It's not like that fire that you have on your stove and it burns your hand. It's not like this fire. Allah's fire is beyond all of that. The fire of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that has been kindled. It has been kindled. So it's the fire of Allah that already showed us, shows us how great this fire is. It's hutama, it's destructive, it shatters things into pieces. And then on top of that, it has also been kindled. And not for one year, not for two, for the existence of humanity, it's constantly being kindled. It is a very, very large fire. So much so that, that the fire speaks about itself and says, Akala ba'di ba'da. A little portion of myself is starting to eat the other portions. This is how severe this fire is. Right? Allah continues and He says, This is a fire that doesn't give you a first degree burn, <laughs> doesn't give you a third degree burn, doesn't give you a second degree burn. Sorry, and I have a doctor watching me. Sheikh Tawfiq is also watching, so I'm a little bit scared on, you know, messing up with the medicine terminology over here. Right? So, the, the, it's not a first degree burn, it's not a second degree burn, it's not a third degree burn. It is a burn that is beyond all of those burns. It is a burn that is so strong, Allah says this burn is not going to just burn your skin. It's not just going to burn your meat and melt it. Allah says this fire will go for the heart. It will burn your skin, burn your flesh and attack the heart. The fire will burn through everything else and then it will get to a, get to the heart. You know why it will get to the heart? Because the reason why such words came down out of the mouth of such a person was because there was a problem with the heart. So the fire will not attack the skin because the skin hasn't committed a sin here. The fire will not attack other parts. It will attack them. That will finish. But it will be going for the heart because the problem was inside of the heart. Oh Allah, cleanse and purify our hearts. Narullahi al muqada Allati tattali'u ala al afida Innaha alayhim muqsada Indeed, this fire is been, has been enclosed upon them. For those people that are claustrophobic, think about this. The fire has been enclosed upon you. Right? Already, Jahannam is not a very friendly place to be in. Hellfire is not a very friendly place to be in. On top of that, the oxygen is being burned. What does fire feed off? It feeds off oxygen, right? So if you burn fire inside of one place and for such a long time, it will eat away at all of the oxygen. And this is what we understand of the fire of the dunya, the fire of the hereafter is even worse than that. Right? It will eat, feed off of all of the oxygen and the fire will burn every single thing that is within this Jahannam. And a people, some people will be inside of this fire. They will be choking because of the fact that they are not able to breathe. There is no oxygen to breathe. This is that fire. This is that fire that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about. Innaha alayhim musada. I always tell people about this. I say, look, you know, some people, when they really want to be indulged with fire, what do they do? They go inside of a car and they start to, if they're bad people, they'll smoke and they'll stay inside of the car with that filthy smoke. Why? Because they call this hot boxing. They want to sit inside of this car and smoke the fumes over and over. Over here, this is a real fire. There's no windows, there's no ventilation, and it's been burning for a very long time. And all of the oxygen is burned. It's not just a little cigarette or something. This is fire. It's burned all of the oxygen. A person cannot breathe anything except of smoke at this moment. Nothing at all. And then Allah says, if that's not enough for you, let me further explain how bad it is. Allah says, this fire is fi amadim mumaddada. It's in poles that have been chained. What does that mean? Okay, I'm going to give you an example. When you are traveling, for those of you that are frequent flyers or frequent travelers, or you travel from a country to another, to another, and to another, and you settle down in different places, what do you do? You, t you normally have suitcases, that's your luggage. And on top of that, you also have boxes. And the boxes, what do you do? You tape the box. And if you want to make sure that the box is taped well, and if you happen to be from the subcontinent, then you'll tape one tape, and then a tape, another tape at the bottom, and tape another diagonally, and then another from the other angle, and another around it, and you'll keep taking, taping it until the security agency at the airport will be like, what the heck is this, right? 
This is how people tape. Why? Because they want to preserve and protect their belongings. And then when they get to the airport, they further want to preserve and protect their belongings. So they'll go to the person that will, that will plastic wrap it, and this is now fully wrapped inside of something. Nobody can open this up. I remember one time I did that with my belongings. Actually, I believe I did that when I was coming to Malaysia, moving to Malaysia from Edmonton. I did it with a few boxes. And the, the, the lady that was giving my boarding pass, she told me that, that, that how are you even able to do this? <laughs> so I told her that it's not as hard as it seems. Anyways, the point is that people do this to preserve their belongings, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and, and things can't get out of it then. Even if the box breaks, things are not going to get out of it. Allah says the fire is enclosed, it's sada, it's mughlaqa. And then I have further enclosed it by putting pillars all around the fire. And around those pillars, I have mumaddada, I have chained and blocked those fires. So there is no, those pillars, so there is no escape. There is no door, there is no escape, there is no ventilation, there is nowhere to go except the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And all of that, Allah is saying, is for the person who speaks ill of people, a person who is not able to control his tongue, a person who is not able to control this between his jawbones. And the Messenger ﷺ said, "Man yadman li, ma bayna lihiyhi, wa ma bayna rijlihi abmanu lahu aljanna." Whoever is able to, what guarantee for me? Those things that are between his jawbones and those things that are between his legs, I will guarantee for him Jannah. Your opportunity to Jannah here. Really, truly an opportunity to Jannah here. All we have to do is stay silent at times. I know it's very, very tempting and difficult. And as I heard one of the speakers over here was saying, it's really a jihad, literally a struggle for a person to hold back, right? When... When, uh, when people are talking about another brother or sister, to hold back from speaking in that gathering, it's not socially friendly for you to say, brothers, let's not talk about this, because another person is going to come say, well, we don't really mean anything but well, right? And another person is going to have another comment. And sometimes a person just is, feels weak not to uh, raise their voice. You have two choices at that moment. You either raise your voice or you walk away. And if the better of the two choices is that you raise your voice. And if you neither raise your white voice and nor do you walk away, then you know what you're doing? You're accepting the third choice. You're also partnering up with them in the sin. You are eating the flesh of your brother. And that's why the scholars, they said, and we are in the month of Ramadan. And these are the last 10 days, the most blessed 10 days in Ramadan. And some said the most blessed 10 days in, in the year. And definitely if today is Laylatul Qadr and we are in the nighttime as we speak, then this is the most blessed night of the year. The Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that whoever does not leave قول الزور من لم يدع قول الزور والعمل به فليس لله حاجة في أن يدع طعامه وشرابه Whoever doesn't leave evil speech and also acting by that evil speech right Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't have a reason for him to leave off his foods and drink, food and drinks You don't have to leave off food and drink right and that's why the scholars they said that there's two types of iftar There's two types of iftar there's two types of breaking your fast. One of them is a iftarun hissiyun. It's a physical iftar. And that's when you get time, when, when Maghrib time comes and you take yourself a date and you make the dua and then you put it in your mouth and then you make the subsequent dua. That is when, that is called a iftar hissi. That's a physical iftar. And then there's a metaphorical iftar and that's called an iftar ma'nawi. And that is an iftar that a person does upon the flesh of his brother. Right, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, أَيُحِبُّ أَحَدُكُمْ أَن يَأْكُلَ لَحْمَ أَخِيهِ مَيْتًا فَكَرِهْتُمُوهُ Does one of you wish to eat the flesh of your brother? If you actually did that, then you would find it very, very despicable and you would hate it. You would, you would find it very, very despicable and you would never go close to it. So if you were to imagine a platter before you and the flesh of your brother before you and you're eating at it, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says you'll never be able to do that. So when you start backbiting a person, saying something evil about a person, to their face even, then think about this platter with flesh of your brother, dead meat of your brother, and you're eating, a gate, you're eating at it. You will never be able to do it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala beautifully describes this particular scene. Why? Because He's trying to make it seem ugly in your eyes. Right? I said beautifully described. The description is beautiful. It's accurate. It's eloquent. But the scene is very, very ugly. And if we were to envision the scene at a moment where our shahwa and our desires are overtaking us for us to speak ill of our brothers, immediately we'll stop. 
I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept our siyam, our fasting. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept our qiyam. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to deliver, deliver us from our sins. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive our shortcomings and forgive our sins. Jazakumullahu khairan for listening. Wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. About the problems of the Muslim community and the trials and tribulations that we were in. So, Mercy Mission was set up as a not for profit community development organization that.